So then God sends Moses back to Egypt and tells him to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. This is this great resonant phrase. Mm -hmm. uh, but Pharaoh isn't so keen on it. No. Why not? Shouldn't he have been glad to see the end of them? <laughs> well, and, uh, the why not really depends in this case on which source we're reading. The plagues are one of the classic uh, biblical passages where the two sources, in this case J and P, are totally interwoven. Uh, and when we unravel them, we get two very different ideas of what the plagues are, what they're for, and how Pharaoh and God are, are acting, and Moses with them. So let's them. start with the Yahwist. Okay, so in the Yahwist, this is, I think, mostly the plagues that we imagine. Uh, it's let my people go. It's Moses going to Pharaoh and saying, right, we, let, let the Israelites go, and Pharaoh agrees and then goes back on his word, and he gets stubborn, and he says, okay, I'll let some of you go, but not all of you, and there's a negotiation, and every plague increases the intensity until finally Pharaoh has to let them go. Now, when Pharaoh gets stubborn in the J strand, mm -hmm. uh, the Yahweh strand of the story, is it because God has hardened his heart? No. He's okay, just, because you see, this is the distinction that most people don't get. That's right. Yes. In the, in the story, in the J story, the Yahweh story, <clears throat> Pharaoh is authentically stubborn, right? He authentically doesn't want to let them go. He likes having them around as slaves. And, uh, and the plagues are an authentic attempt by God and Moses to get Pharaoh to change his mind. Yeah. The P story, the priestly story, is quite different. In this story... The plagues are not actually an attempt to get Pharaoh to change his mind. In fact, Pharaoh can't change his mind even if he wants to. This is the story in which God hardens Pharaoh's heart after each plague. So God sends a plague, and then even if Pharaoh might have thought, boy, I better get these Israelites out of here, God says, nope, you have to, you're going to keep up the stubbornness, right? So Pharaoh has no free will in the priestly story. Okay, to back up a little bit then to the Yahweh source. Mm. Is this typical of God in the Yahweh source? Does he otherwise try to persuade people? And what, what does it tell us about this view of God? Well, is he really in control? He is less in control well, than the God yeah. of, of P, that's for sure. The, the Yahweh's God is the same one who, uh, for example, in the story of the Garden of Eden, says to Adam, you know, looks for Adam, says, where are you, right? Yeah. Did you eat, did yeah. you eat the apple? Did you eat the fruit? Uh, this is the same God who uh, says to Cain, uh, where's your yeah. brother? Uh, so this is definitely a God who operates through dialogue. And the question of control, I would say certainly this is a less omniscient and perhaps slightly less omnipotent God than in the priestly source, and by okay. far than we think today. Let me press you a little bit on that. Mm. Does it make any sense to say less omniscient or less omnipotent? You know, if you're less, you're not omni. I think that's, Sorry. then I think that's yeah. safe to say. Yeah. I think that's safe to say. So this, if you were making a little th list of thing, 10 things you didn't know about God, I guess you could put this on them. I mean, a lot of people, you know, count the Bible as their revelation of God, mm. and I don't think they always notice what it's actually saying, quite apart from the contradictions, which we'll get this to in true. a minute. Well, I mean, what I but, think it's important yeah. is, is to recognize that Jay is not omniscient, not omnipotent deity, Yeah, is not the deity of the Old Testament, right? There. True. Right. So it's it's not a question of is that the only deity? It's not the, the only deity of the, the Old Testament. Yes. Yeah. That, that God is, Im, yeah. is is imagined differently by different authors at different times at different books of the Old Testament. Certainly, when you get to you know Second Isaiah, you have a, a very different view of God than we yeah. have in in the Yahwist. But in the Yahwist, this is the same God who could admit that he made a mistake this is before right. the flood. This is right. And uh, so he needs. To, to bring Pharaoh along, so to speak. That, I, think that's, yeah. I think that's true. And then in comes the priestly source, and this God doesn't have to take uh, humans into account at all very no. much. No, I mean, in yeah. the priestly story of the plagues, it's not only that God is not trying to 
convince Pharaoh to let them go. The plagues aren't, aren't really about Pharaoh at all or about the Israelites. They're not called plagues in the priestly story. They're called yeah. signs and wonders. And in the priestly version of, of the story, Pharaoh isn't given an introduction to any of them. He's not told they're going to happen, given a chance to repent, none of that. In fact, most of them take place all in a sequence with Moses and Pharaoh standing in one room. And there's just sign, sign, sign. And God says at the very yeah. beginning, he says, I am doing this in order to demonstrate my power. This is a pure demonstration yeah. of power. And at the end of it, the Israelites are going to leave. We know this all in advance. Yeah. We know that Pharaoh's not going to do anything. We know they're going to leave. And it's purely about God punishing through these demonstrations of power, punishing the Egyptians for what they had done. Yeah. So now, what are we to make nowadays of a God who hardens people's hearts? The question of free the... will, I think, is a really long-standing one. But it, yeah. this, th what this makes us wonder is, how much, how angry can we get at Pharaoh, right, if, for, for not letting the people go, if God never gave Pharaoh a chance to let the people go? Yeah. Is, is Pharaoh really guilty? I mean, he's, he is treated as if he were. Mm. And I think lack of free will never counts as an excuse <laughs> in the Bible. You know, it's like in, in a modern context, ignorance of the law. That's right. Is no excuse. <laughs> what I would, lack of free will is no excuse in the Bible. Right. What, I would, what I would certainly say is that uh, even if Pharaoh does not have free will at the moment that he's being punished, the assumption is he, and importantly, the entire Egyptian people, yeah. are guilty of having enslaved the Israelites back at the beginning. And in fact, when you look back to the beginning of Exodus, the Egyptians enslaved the Israelites, the Egyptians as a whole, right, as a corporate body. Yeah. And it is no surprise then that when the plagues come, the Egyptians are punished as a body, right? In the priestly plagues, all of Egypt is struck by each of these plagues. Yeah. Now, why do you think the, the priestly writer goes for that kind of a view of God? Why is the, the God of the priestly writer so much more absolute? Is it that the priestly writer thinks that this is more worthy of God, so to speak, to be an absolute sovereign? I think uh, that the... It's almost pharaonic. Well, I mean, I think that for uh, uh, the priestly writers, and not only for them, but for others, right, God in Israel really takes on uh, the role that is usually ascribed to kings elsewhere. Yeah. God is... Uh, the absolute monarch. Mm -hmm. And certainly uh, for the priestly authors, right, they want their God to be sort of above and beyond, right? Not yeah. concerned with, you know, not concerned with petty human problems. Now, let me put the question to you another way. Do you think the priestly authors were deliberately trying to correct the Yahweh's theology? Do you think this is written with an eye to the Yahweh's theology and that they're producing a new and improved version? I don't think so. so. I don't think so. I think yeah. that, I mean, there are a few reasons to think this. First of all, we should mention the plagues in each of the two sources are different. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the plagues. What did they do? Well, they, <clears throat> in the J story, for example, they have some in common, right? They all agree that yeah. there are blood and frogs and hail and locusts. But in J, there are, I think, insects, and in P, there are lice, which we sort of get confused these days about which is which. Uh, P, has, <laughs> P has a plague of darkness that J doesn't know about. Yeah. Uh, J has a plague of cattle disease that P doesn't know about that neither of them actually has 10 plagues, right? 10 plagues is a yeah. number that's created when the two stories are, are put together. They probably each had something like seven, uh, which is another good, a good, number. A good biblical yeah. number. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the fact that they don't have the exact same plagues to me suggests that they come to the table with their own independent traditions of the plagues. Okay, yeah. And so you do not subscribe to the view that the priestly author is just modifying the earlier sources. No, I think, I think, I think that own, he's got his, his, own, his own traditions that he it. brings to the table. But, but uh, thinking again a little bit about what's going on here in the, the plagues, 
uh, you could make a case that, oh, the Egyptians deserved it anyway. Although some of the things that happened to them now are pretty horrible, and we'll come to the worst of them eventually. Mm. Uh, but uh, what about the rivers? This, this whole thing looks like an environmentalist nightmare. <laughs> a river what turning is, to blood. And... Yeah, what does this god actually, does this god care for his own creation? You know, if we were to spin off a little bit from this, mm -hmm. uh, the Bible and the environment. No, this is a mixed record, isn't it? It's, it's certainly, I mean, this is a god yeah. who, back at the beginning of Genesis, is perfectly happy to destroy the entirety of his own creation. Yeah. Uh, I think the idea of environmentalism as a concept, we certainly can't ascribe to the Bible. Right, yeah. Uh, in part because... Yeah. It hadn't been invented yet. It hadn't been invented yet, yeah. and there was no need to have invented it yet. Yeah. Right? The ancient Israelites were technologically incapable of destroying the environment in any way that would require an environmentalist movement to protect it. Uh, the question is, uh, and I think I would put the question to you, do we think that the Bible has a sense of the land or animals as something that is worthy uh, in and of itself? Or is it merely, yeah. is there an instrumentalist uh, relationship between yes, man I, and, I think and the land? Th this is the way the question would be put in contemporary discussions of environmentalism and the like. Do animals and the land have intrinsic value right. or just an instrumental value? Mm -hmm. And I think there's some variation on that in the Bible. Uh, I think, for example, at the end of the book of Job, it seems like the mountain goats you know, are good in their own right. They're <laughs> things that God ought to worry about. Mm -hmm. But as, as we've been seeing, you know, there's more than one theology here. Right. And in an awful lot of the Bible, I think in the passages we're talking about, uh, it seems to be more an instrumental value mm -hmm. that uh, animals and the land are subordinated to people. Yeah. Now, I, I, I mean, I think that if you can see the real dichotomy right at the beginning of Genesis. Yeah. But in Genesis 1, where the land and the animals and the plants are all created before people, yeah. and they are all declared to be good before people have even been created, that seems to suggest some intrinsic value. Whereas in Genesis 2, yeah. when the land, or at least the plants and the animals are all created in service of, right, they're created to be man's you know, sustenance and playthings. Yeah. That seems more instrumentalist to me, but it, uh, this is to say that we shouldn't expect a single biblical view. That's true, but of course, even in Genesis 1, it ends up then with the, where they're being told to have dominion That's right. over the earth. This is the enormously controversial thing. Right. Now, in Exodus, this isn't really what we're dealing about. It's God who has the dominion, mm -hmm. but when, it is a little bit shocking the way he exercises it in a way, at least. It's th this certainly was not tailored for modern environmentalism. No. You will find better, more congenial things in the Bible, uh, right. but, but here... But the, pla the plagues really are, goes, I mean, yeah. they do really look like natural disasters, right? This is the bringing yeah. of, I mean, it's rivers, it's frogs, yeah. it's locusts, it's, di it's cattle disease, it's, it's it's yeah. very much all natural disaster. Now, and of course, there is a school of thought that says there must be here the recollection of some actual natural disasters, mm -hmm. and so that there would be a kind of historical nucleus here in the story of the plagues as well. That's right. What the, do you the, think the, of the that? Cl the classic for me for that is, occasionally there is a bloom of red algae in the Nile, right, that makes yes. it, give, has it, gives it the appearance of redness. That's what's going on. In the, uh, in, in, the, in the turning of the Nile to blood. And, and several scholars in recent times have, have written about an Asiatic illness, mm. that there was apparently some kind of Asian flu or something <laughs> right. that spread in Egypt. Does that have any relevance to the story? Any, anything like that? No, the most I think we can say yeah. from that is those kinds of natural events may have provided the authors with the ideas for what kinds of plagues might have afflicted Egypt. Right. But, so to, they, but they, to take they, the miraculous out of the story is to miss the point of the story entirely. Indeed, indeed, yeah. That they supply at best a kind of local color. That's right, yeah. that's right. But the story but is one the, of, of God acting in history. It's not a natural right. disaster. Yeah.